right? So um, good morning, everyone, or good evening, wherever you are. Today, I'll be talking about decentralizing video games. Decentralizing video games is kind of a, a big topic, and it's a bit um, geared towards my specific industry, which is in video games. But uh, it applies to other industries as well, aside from, from the game industry. So I hope you'll take away uh, something from the talk. So a little bit of a background on me. My name is Paul. I'm the CTO and co-founder of OP Games. And OP Games is my startup. I have I've run a few startups in the games industry and exited uh, one of them. And through the games, through being in the game industry for quite a while, you kind of see how the the industry kind of moves in cycles. And I'll be touching on that a bit when we start and and that's kind of like a, a background or like the 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 overarching background of this talk so it's good to begin by taking us a little of a step back so when we look at the video games industry and the cycles that it moves in we we know that the video game industry has it's kind of a newer industry than most but it also moves in technology and market cycles. And right now, when you look at the video game industry, you can see that we're in a very mature market cycle, wherein there is still some growth, but there are hallmarks of it becoming a very challenging market, which isn't very conducive to, to newcomers. And we will see also how this kind of market is kind of also ripe for, for people to, to innovate on. So as a mature market, we can see that the competition in games is kind of very fierce right now. So, so on the left side of the slide, you can kind of see one of the more extreme years where competition was very fierce. In 2017, about two or three of the games were able to make just about the top 80% of the revenue. So there's a very sharp power cycle, very sharp power curve when we look at how revenues are distributed in the industry. So this competition isn't just obvious in, in the graphs. There, there have been also uh, surveys with game developers, as you see here on the right side of the slide, that. Um, the main concern of mobile game developers around the world is competition and how much, uh, how many games there are out there in the market. So being a new game developer is kind of really challenging in a, in a very mature market. And it's important to note these two things also, these two other concerns that game developers have, which is uh, the rising UA costs, UA meaning user acquisition, Rising marketing costs, which is the cost of getting your game discovered. And the amount of free content is also important. So you can kind of see that it's kind of a race to the bottom to, to get the revenues. So I, I'd like us to take note of these two things, the UA costs and marketing costs. Because this is kind of important to, the ne to this next slide, which wherein we see a lot, most of the monetization methods of games has actually centered around ads and in-app purchases. So in, the, in a very mature market, you kind of see that value consolidates around platforms. And in the case of games, we kind of see it consolidating around ad networks because they're the ones that handle the ads and app stores through which all of these in-app purchases flow through. So in a very consolidated market, we can see all of the value going through these platforms. So that when you see, look at this diagram, you can see that ad networks and app stores, they are the ones that are the arbiters of value in the ecosystem. So whenever a developer needs to transact with the player, all of these has to first go through these app stores. Whenever a player wants to get something for the game, it has to either go through in-app purchases or they can either watch an ad so they're able to get something back in the game. 
So in a very mature market where, where platforms have kind of consolidated the value, it's these platforms that now define the rules. They are the ones that tell you, are we able to use crypto in our, uh, in our ecosystem, for example? So in this case, we see that most of the app stores don't really care to, to add other alternative monetizations. And this makes sense because when you're in a very mature market and the platforms are the ones that are really controlling all the value, they're kind of disincentivized to improve because all of the value is now uh, to their benefit. So that this is something that we call platform lock-in. And when platform lock-in happens, it kind of disincentivizes the improvement of the platform. So in the game industry, being a very mature market, you can kind of see that uh, there's a clamor for change already for, from several sectors. Um, from the player side, here on the slide, you can see that. Uh, th these are two player testimonials on how they're kind of not, uh, they're not very happy about the industry anymore. The first one is, is from a player who's playing this game and he's saying that he needs people's help because he's having major mental issues around not being able to control himself from paying for, for in-app advertisements. The other one here is about a player saying that games right now are really paid to win. And he tries to harken back to the time when games were all about achieving things or about the narrative rather than paying to be able to, to beat your opponent. So there's also clamor for change aside from the players, from the developers. So here on the, set, on the middle of the slide, we can see the top games that are making revenues in the past year. And these games, they haven't really changed in the past five years. The past five years is the same games just moving up and down the, up and down the charts. So developers, uh, these are the developers that are making money, but there's a very long tail of other developers that are barely breaking even or not even making money with their games. And then the last part of the slide, we see that even government is starting to get involved. That they see that players are, aren't happy. They're, it's being a bit exploitative to them already. And some of these game systems are starting to look like gambling. And in Belgium, they, kinda, they already banned a way of monetization of these games. So we can read down here also that gamers are actually supportive of the ban. So, so there's this clamor of change from the players, from the developers, and even government. But the platforms really won't be incentivized to change it. So we're kind of stuck here in this very mature market. But as technology cycles go and market cycles go, uh, as we see that the, the games industry becomes very mature, this is also a time when it's really ripe for disruption. So uh, we've seen this before in, in the game industry. We've seen this happen, for example, with uh, the rise of social games. We've seen this happen uh, when PC games started to migrate or game developers started to migrate from PC over to mobile. So this is a natural cycle. Um, platforms really will consolidate uh, value around the market, but this is uh, exactly the right time for us as builders to, to look at where we can go in, try to look at what the market is, is asking of us and, and try to build around that. So being in this space, I believe that um, when we see the value that Web3, blockchain, and all of these technologies and movements around decentralization, we can see that these are the beginnings of, of what would be able to change the, the platform economics. And I'll discuss how we could possibly use these, these coming technologies and movements to be able to decentralize games. So this is a big question. So how do we decentralize games? And it's, uh, and I hearken back to Amara's law, which says that, uh, we, we always underestimate the value of our technology over the long term. And we are right now in a very early stage in decentralization in games. And we don't really know how it will look like yet. We don't really know the, the, uh, the final version of how a mature decentralized game will be. But uh, 
we're kind of starting to see how this will go based on the technologies that are coming up and also some of the similar movements around decentralization that are that are also building with web3 so um, so this is a possible playbook that we can take a look at uh, this is based on what the platforms are strong uh, strong at right now which we can possibly disrupt with our current web3 technologies so we'll we'll see identity data and asset ownership as three things that these platforms control and these are the, the specific areas where we can start taking a look at how to disrupt the how we can disrupt uh, their control over the these uh, items uh, i'll discuss each one of these one by one and then we'll go through the next one around more around the movements of open source and co-op So uh, regarding identity, usually when you play a game or when you download an app, you need to log into a certain identity, so, so a certain identity account. So this might be the Google Play Games, for example, or a Facebook login. And as users and as players and as developers, we've kind of been used to this paradigm. It's very convenient for us to just use our login on Google or for us as developers to just use the same the same structures as Facebook has in identifying our users. This is actually not helping us in the long run because it 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 kind of uh, it kind of limits us in developing because our players are our players are stuck in this closed ecosystem. So a way to change platform identity is to use, if to use the current technologies around crypto now, which deals with decentralized identity. So an example here is Web3 model, which is a, a protocol, an open source protocol that allows us to use any, any of the supported wallets to be able to, to log on to certain services. So we see here that Web3 Web3 model can be used to log on to MetaMask or in or any of these other third-party services. So one thing to take note of also is uh, this might be a way to decentralize and allow us to define where our identity is being custodially handled. But we need to be aware also that this is a certain kind of platform in itself. So we need to not build on the platforms but build on the protocols that web3 model is building on so after identity we take a look at data so platforms have usually been the ones who control data in in the video game industry so you can kind of see this with uh, for example cloud services we see when you're playing a game it's uh, most of the data is usually stored centralized in a cloud service like AWS. And, uh, and this data is usually not really the, I mean, this data is usually mostly monetized by the platforms and there's no real benefit for players and developers. So if you have data on a server, it's mostly the developer paying for the service from Amazon. It's mostly them renting out the service where players can play their games. So this is kind of the status quo. There, we can't really see for now a lot of any alternatives to this, mainly because AWS is, has kind of the, the, the scale to be able to handle a lot of players and they're the services where a lot of the tooling is built on. But we can kind of see uh, some other alternative ways to do this now with certain protocols that are coming up. Uh, a good example of this is IPFS, which is a, it's a peer-to-peer -peer hypermedia protocol, wherein instead of storing the data in just a centralized server, we're able to store data across nodes. So these nodes can either be several other different servers this can be even stored on the player for example so this kind of changes the the way we store data and the way we value data that instead of us renting out, out servers would there be a way for it to 
possibly store the, the data on our player side, for example, and possibly maybe mo find a way to monetize that on their end. So this kind of shakes up the current paradigm of centralized data that the platforms currently benefit on. So aside from identity data, the third part is asset ownership. So in games, usually a lot of their revenue is taken whenever someone purchases an in-game item or an asset or, or, any, or any item that they own in the game. So in these cases though, a lot of the times, the only way for a player to buy these items is to go through the game's platform and there's no way to trade these items around. There's also no way to take them out of the ecosystem of the game itself. So for example, you're playing a game, you buy an item, and the moment that you wanna change your game or the moment that you don't wanna use your account anymore, that item is trapped there. But that item has actual monetary value. It has actual value that people have worked to be able to acquire that item. So even if the item is closed in an ecosystem and isn't really part of a crypto system, it still has actual monetary value. So an alternative to, to these items that are locked inside game universes is the centralized asset ownership. So you kind of see this happening now with the start of NFTs. You kind of see items that are being created outside of their game universes. So when you create these items based on a standard such as NFT, they, are, they aren't tied to a specific game. You, they are able to you kind of unlock their value and not just have them be useful in, in a very small network, but they're able to be used across networks. And this, also allows them to to build new opportunities around opportunities or even jobs around these these new asset classes so aside from players we might be able to have people create these items for example or people just collect these items around different universes this kind of opens up the economy to something bigger So to kind of recap on those, these three things, if you wanted to decentralize the, the games industry, there are three ways that we could start doing it. One is through identity, data, and then through asset ownership. But uh, decentralization is nothing new. It's actually a movement that uh, started even before Web3. We can kind of see platforms how platforms uh, consolidating value as something that isn't really conducive to a lot of players in, in an ecosystem. And we can look at two other sources of um, two other movements that are, that are very, very good references for us to learn how to disrupt these platforms. So when we look at these two platforms, it's kind of like standing on the shoulders of giants because these two, two movements, uh, these two movements of open source and co-ops have been here for a while and they have been able to successfully disrupt platforms. They've been able to successfully decentralize certain economies. It's really good to, to see what, what they have done well and apply that to, to any of the industries that we're looking at. So to start with, open source really is a is a, a really good model for when we're looking to disrupt something. For in the first place, a lot of these platforms rely on us building on their closed ecosystems. So for example, just just when we're making a game, a game relies on a lot of technology. And a lot of game developers have been used to making games on engines such as uh, Unity or Unreal. And what game developers usually don't realize is these platforms are ecosystems. These game engines are ecosystems in themselves. And by building on them, 
we kind of limit us ourselves on being building on the platforms rules building on the platforms economics so but if we look at open source there are actually a lot of other tools that are mature enough that could be able to handle what these monolithic engines are doing so one important point also is aside from building an open source we need to consider building on the web as we've seen the platforms usually have their own way for for developers to deploy or for developers to monetize which is through ads or the in-game in-game purchases but the web is an open it's an open area to deploy your game you can just put it up on a website you can uh, also make use of all of the groundbreaking technologies that are being developed right now on the web like uh, xr for augmented reality so the web is actually a, a good way to start building new economies on top of and we don't since we're used to app stores and ad networks that doesn't mean we can explore other ways of doing so so one one good example of a game engine is Babylon JS. Babylon JS is a very mature and sophisticated 3D engine where where there are already a solution successfully used to build several good games. Another engine that we can possibly use is Phaser, which is very optimized for 2D. It's easier to learn and has a really huge community of game developers around it. And uh, aside from game engines, we can actually also use open source to build the, the things behind the hood of a game. For example, multiplayer servers or any other services that our developers need. So a good example of this is Coliseus, which is a, an open source multiplayer server. And it's built mostly on JavaScript. So this is another important point also. Uh, JavaScript is a very, very big uh, developer base and it's also it also has a very uh, very vibrant ecosystem of uh, people developing modules so if you're building a game on JavaScript it's easier to put all of these open source modules together and really build a game that does it need to to use all of the native properties of, of a mobile app you can actually just build it on JavaScript on the browser So we have open source as, a, as the first movement we can take a look at to kind of shake up the platform economics of, of an industry. But another one that's been also brewing, that's also been brewing is uh, platform co-ops. Co so platform co-ops have been there a while. You can kind of see a lot of uh, the hallmarks of decentralization there. So if you want to see real, uh, real concrete examples of people creating new economies versus the platforms, a good book to read is Ours to Hack and to Own by Trevor Schultz and Nathan Schneider. And to go to metagov.org, which shows a lot of how people are thinking about when, when governing virtual worlds. So, so with these three things, uh, hitting, I, hit changing identity, changing uh, asset ownership, and changing data, and then looking at open source and platform co-ops, we can kind of start remaking platform economics and have a strategy on really how to decentralize games. So a, a call to action to people now, is something we can do right now very concretely, is we need to be able to create sort of like a convergence stack similar to what or Unity has done, LAMP has done for web development and Unity has done for game engines. So Jamie Burke, the CEO of Outlier, who is one of the good thinkers in Web3, says that when people talk about mass adoption, they typically mean 99% of consumers. So we need to improve upon Web2 apps. They need to be faster, exper experientially better, and possibly more private. Mass adoption will only come when we have found ways to abstract away the complexities of Web3, 
making them invisible to the average user. So this is what we as developers need to do. And this is also something that us in, in OP games are trying to build. So if you're interested in helping us build this invisible protocol in us building this convergence stack, check out, check out game3js.com. Reach out to us in, in these links and we'll be very glad to, to build these technologies with you and to explore the new economies that we can build when we decentralize with your games.